Hello, Mr. D'Souza. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you, sir? I'm good, thanks. I'm so glad to hear it. You have a great background there. I, I love the look of your office. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Well, shall we get right into it? Yeah, let's do it. I'm ready. Great. Are you here? Here being the Paul Leslie Hour and you being you. Welcome to episode number 1035. We are honored today to welcome Dinesh D'Souza, the author of several New York Times bestseller books, and as a filmmaker, Dinesh D'Souza has directed some of the highest grossing political documentaries of all time. Mr. D'Souza is joining Paul today to talk about his book and film entitled Vindicating Trump. Perfect for this interview, huh? And it's coming out only seven days from America's ultimate election. Oh, real quick. We'd love it if you hit the subscribe button and give this a thumbs up. Oh, and share it with those you like and love. And with that, all we got to do now is say, let's go. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to welcome today one of the most successful documentary filmmakers of all time. He's also a best-selling author, a New York Times best-selling author. His latest book is entitled Vindicating Trump. It is also a major motion picture. It's a great pleasure and talk about historic times to do an interview like this. Thank you for making the time. It's a real pleasure. Thank you for having me. Mr. D'Souza, you created many very compelling films. I've watched so many of them. You are also a great writer. What would you say has always been the purpose of the work you create? I am an immigrant to the United States. I came uh, in my teenage years as an exchange student, and I discovered something very unique about America. Initially, I was interested just in the ladders of opportunity, the ability of someone to come to the country with little or nothing, and then make it. And by make it, I mean achieve the American dream. I don't just mean become successful, but be able to achieve your life's objectives. And I, and I became interested in what kind of society makes this possible? How should a society be organized so citizens have a chance to do that? And uh, that led me to studies of American history and the American founding. So my politics is loosely based on that. I then realized uh, after spending some time in sort of think tanks, which are research foundations and writing for a scholarly audience, that I wanted to widen the reach of my work. And this led me into the field. Well, my writing became a little bit more general interest, and but, the, but I also began to do the documentary films. And, and I realized that films, although a form of entertainment, can be used as a form of very powerful messaging, as long as you don't forget the entertainment component of them. So I've now made eight documentary films. I'm indicating Trump is the latest one. And I like the, the idea of the, the book and the film. It's kind of my one-two punch. The book is more like a legal brief. It lays out an argument quite in a very systematic form with references. The movie is more of an exhilarating journey or a narrative, and is usually built around a uh, an enigma or a question that we're trying to sort of see our way through and discover the truth about. And, and, and this is no less true of the new film as it is of earlier films. Well, everyone out there, if they want more information, they can go to vindicatingtrump.com. And as we've been mentioning here, it is both a motion picture and a book. You can check out both or just one. And a theme in both of them is this idea that the mainstream media or the legacy media has perpetuated that Trump is a tyrant. And you go through, and I thought this was very clever, the Democrats' greatest hits in the film. All of these things, white supremacist is a big one, racist, all of these names that they've called him. How can someone best refute this idea that he's a tyrant? Well... It's one thing if someone were to warn that a person that you don't know much about, his, you can say he's going to do this and he's going to do that. Now, it's a little more difficult if the guy has been already in the exact office that he is trying to get back into, because 
then you have to you have a more complicated case against him that he wasn't really a tyrant the first time but sort of tyrannical motives have now crept in and he's really going to be a tyrant the second time around that's actually a lot more implausible now having said that on the one hand i do want to say that merely refuting the charge doesn't answer the psychological question about why that charge why do they call him that You know, Mm. people would never call McCain a tyrant or Romney. People didn't even call Reagan a tyrant. They'd say, well, Reagan's a washed up movie actor, but they didn't say he's a he's an existential danger to democracy. So there's a reason that they say this about Trump. And I think here is the reason. Trump is, in fact, larger than life. Trump has a certain kind of power. You could even call it a secret power that I don't think anyone else has, certainly not in American politics now and maybe never. And here, I I pose the question to Trump in the film in this way. I say to him, I said, you know, they keep saying you called for an insurrection on January 6th. And as far as I can see, you didn't do that. Uh, You didn't tell people go in the Capitol or take over the place or shut, shut down the count. None of that. I said, but guess what? Had you called for an insurrection, there would have been one, a real one. And there would be one if you called from one now. And so... The point I'm trying to make here is this, that of who else could you say this, right? If Marco Rubio called for an insurrection, would anyone show up? Even if Kamala Harris called for an insurrection, it would be considered a public joke. So my point to Trump was, you have a certain kind of extraordinary power. Do you recognize that? And second, how do you intend to use it? Now, quite honestly, I don't think Trump's ever been asked a question like this before. You can see he's like, uh, oops, I, I got to think through this one. And you can kind of see the tumblers of his mind working. This is part of, I think, the intrigue of the conversation at the heart of this film. It subjects Trump to new types of questions. And it brings out a side of Trump you haven't seen before that, again, it's not a different Trump. It just rounds out the picture. And. What an incredible question. It's great that you came up with that. And it's it's so, so discovery-oriented, like a lot of your documentaries. I find that writing is an incredible discovery tool. In writing Vindicating Trump and in getting to sit down with President Trump, and also there's other people, Alina Abba, uh, Laura Trump, that people will see in this documentary – Was there something that you discovered as a result of this fact-finding and investigation that was surprising to you? I would put it this way. It wasn't so much that it was surprising to me. It is that I had seen in the private sphere things about Trump that Trump himself resists putting on the public stage. He has a manly aversion, for example, to showing feelings. When Dr. Phil tried to interview him, he he went full psychologist on Trump. He said, how did the assassination attempt make you feel? And if you watch Trump, he's very uncomfortable. He he sort of refuses to go there. He'll he'll just go on and into the Trumpian shtick and tell you basically what he said at the rally the previous night, because he doesn't want to uh, open himself up in that way. So my idea was not to psychologize Trump at all, but rather to draw out a side of Trump that I think is very appealing to people, but but one, as I say, that is not often seen. My, my motive in interviewing Laura Trump, of course, she's the co-chair of the RNC. I wanted to talk about election fraud. But I also thought she's the perfect person to talk to because she's in the Trump family. So she sees Trump up close. And yet, she has what could be called in-law objectivity. She's not really a Trump. She married into the Trump family. So she will have a certain critical distance in being able to talk. And it turns out to be the perfect choice for that reason. Alina Haba is there to talk about the lawfare, which, of course, is, is I call it a form of legal assassination. You have character assassination. You have legal assassination. Now, of course, we know you have two actual assassination attempts. So there's got to be something about Trump that makes him a very scary guy for all this energy to be deployed against him. I mean, you know, sometimes I'll say and somewhat whimsically, but I mean, no one's trying to assassinate Paul Ryan, right? Because why would you? Well, it's a waste of time. <laughs> Interesting. Yes. Well, you've gained so much knowledge from making this film and writing this book, which again, it's vindicatingtrump.com for everybody out there. And now here we are. We are mere days from election day. Do you have any predictions that you would like to make? Yes, I think that 
Well, I think that Trump is looking really good. And, and, and what I mean is I think that the, the, the media, which is operating not as an arm of the Democratic Party, but sort of in sync with the Democratic Party, has created two caricatures, a very negative caricature of Trump and a very positive caricature of Kamala Harris. And both caricatures are sort of crumbling. People are seeing, well, Trump is not this ogre that you've tried to make him all this nonsense about don't normalize Trump, all these pompous people who think that they have a superior character to Trump. Oh, really? Well, Aristotle says that the most important virtue is courage. Trump mm. has almost superhuman courage as evidenced not simply by his reaction to the two assassination attempts. I mean, who would react that way? But also the way he has endured through 91 criminal charges. Any other political figure facing two criminal charges would have quit the race, fled the field, never be heard from again. So Trump is so powerful in this area of courage. Uh, and you've got all these people who are obviously of far inferior character somehow saying, and some of them Republicans, by the way, well, Trump needs to be more like us. And I'm thinking, well, if he's more like you, he would not be the effective fighter that he is. He would be in the cowering, miserable position that you're in right now. So, so I think that the Trump is looking very strong. He's breaking through the, the media portrait of him. And similarly, Kamala Harris is breaking through, but in a bad way. In other words, people are realizing that she is, T.S. Lewis, the poet, once used the phrase, a hollow man, by which he meant a person who's pure uh, facade. There's really, it's not that there's, there's bad stuff inside. There's really nothing inside. It's just purely hollow. And that's what she is. The scary thing is in Kamala Harris, it's the regime that is manipulating Kamala Harris the way it manipulated Biden as a sort of ventriloquist puppet. Mm. Wow. Very well put. For the person out there who reads Vindicating Trump or they will see the motion picture, what do you want them to take away from it? What do you want them to get from that experience? The book and the film are very different because the genres are different. The book is more like a, a legal brief. It's an argument. So the strength of it is that it it, it grabs on to a sort of an enigma, a puzzle, or a powerful idea. It holds on to it, and it carries you all the way through. The powerful idea here is drawn from Abraham Lincoln. In one of his early speeches called the Lyceum Speech, Abraham Lincoln predicts, he prophesies, that if America is ever destroyed, Lincoln says, it will not come from the outside. It will come from the inside. Lincoln says, you will see a rising tide of lawlessness, and then some regime, some Caesar, as Lincoln puts it, will exploit this lawlessness to subvert our constitutional republic. Now, of course, the left looks at that and they go, oh, yes, Lincoln was right. Yes, a Caesar. That's Donald Trump. But of course, the, the question that I ask and explore both in the book and the film is, yes, the threat of tyranny today is real. We see many indications of it in our society, but is it coming from Trump or is it coming from the left and from the Democrats? And then the book is off and running. The film is a little bit of a different animal because a film ultimately is not an argument. It's a journey of discovery. And so I make my films in a very cinematic way. They are very entertaining recreations. They are the advantage of having the one on one with Trump is I don't have to tell you about Trump. Trump's right there. You can see him and he's reacting in an unusual way that you haven't seen a side of him before. So you make up your own mind. The film is show, don't tell. And, and I think the two complement each other very nicely. Well, this may seem like it just comes from way out there, but a person could make the observation that President Donald Trump is much like the main character in a Western film. What do you think about that comparison? I wholeheartedly endorse it. And I say this as someone who, uh, who watched West Westerns in India before I came to America. It was kind of my introduction to American life was the movies. And, and I think we're living in the plot of a Western and to this degree. In a typical Western, you have a peaceful, harmonious small town. It's called Shinbone or Pleasantville, something like that. And it's got an old sheriff. I'm going to call the old sheriff the GOP establishment. You know, this is sort of like uh, like um, the um, uh, Paul Ryan types or the Mitt Romney types. But then along come some ruthless gangsters. And these are the Obama Democrats. They take over the place. They intimidate the town. They're now running it. It's no longer shinbone. And things are very dire. But then over the mountain, 
unexpectedly comes an outsider, a stranger. Well, that's Trump. And not a lot is known about him. And some people say he had a shady past or a shady background. But the gangsters know that he's the guy they have to look out for. He's the threat to their regime, to their system. They have to, they have to buy him off, chase him away, beat him up, kill him. He is the very scary guy that they have to deal with. And, and so far, I think it's a description of where we are now. We don't know the ending of this particular Western we're living through. In, the, in a typical Western movie, the ending is always this, that having vanquished the gangsters, the hero, Clint Eastwood or John Wayne uh, or Charles Bronson, will get on his horse and leave. And the reason for the leaving is very significant because it is a way of saying, hey, listen, I could have become the head gangster myself. I've defeated the gangsters, so I can be a gangster, just in the way that, by the way, the left warns about Trump. But I'm not going to, because I don't want to. I'm going to give you Shinbone back. I've, I've made Shinbone great again. I've, I've eliminated the threat. And so I'm going to ride off into the sunset. This is actually my hopeful vision of what is actually going to happen, that Trump will have a second term. He will defeat the gangsters. He will ride off into the sunset. And we won't have Trump anymore. But the Trumpian spirit will continue to endure and energize our society into the future. I see a question coming in right now. What is your all-time favorite Western? I have several, but I would put The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance as probably my favorite because I think it is it is a Western that, although it is within the type, it also plays against the type. Uh, in other words, it departs from the formula of the normal Western. You could write a PhD thesis on that film because the themes in it are really so profound. I won't say more about that now, but merely to say that it is a it is a Western that plums the depths. This is a very atypical election. And from watching this film, I have to say there's so much that someone can think about. I was left thinking about a lot of different things. What do you think people will say about this election in a hundred years? I think that people will look back and 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 see this as a a kind of a turning point in, in in a good way or in a bad way. I think that Trump has established that he is a very consequential figure. Quite honestly, that will be that would be true even if he's not elected in in uh, this year, because he represents something that is very large. Vivek Ramaswamy said almost incidentally something. He said, you know, if, if Trump had not turned his head with the first assassination attempt and had been killed. He says America would have ended. Now, what a thing to say, in a sense, almost implying that Trump is America, in a sense. But I think actually the statement is true. Not that America, the place would go away, not that the American people would go away, but a certain idea of America, which is exactly the idea that drew me to America as an immigrant a whole generation or two generations ago, that America perhaps would have died had that bullet found its mark. I always like to leave the last word to the guest. For anyone who's tuned in listening to us, what would you say? Very open-ended question. Well, I would say that we are not living in normal times. And there's a lot of wishful thinking, particularly among Republicans. I think they, they think it's still 1983. And they think that normal ways of engaging in politics are, are fine. And that somehow we will get it all back. And I want to say that the America that I came to a generation and a half ago is gone. It's not here anymore. We're not living in Reagan's America. And the implications of that need to sink in because 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 I think some very bad things are happening in the country. I would say it's not an exaggeration to say that the country in some respects, not in all, but in some, is in free fall. And so a lot of effort is needed. The, the re-election of Trump is only the first step. There's a lot of things we have to do in terms of a not just a political revival, but I would say a cultural revival, a moral revival, possibly even a spiritual revival. Uh, it takes a lot to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Well, Mr. D'Souza, on behalf of all the viewers and listeners, thank you so much for spending time with us. It's my pleasure. Thank you, sir. All right. I can't wait for the next book or film. <laughs> all right. So good talking to you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You know, the Paul Leslie Hour is made possible by people like you. 
listeners, viewers, please go to thepaulleslie.com slash support, and you'll know what to do when you're there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who contributes. Performance of The Entertainer intro song by John Primerano. And of course, this is your announcer speaking. See you next time on the Paul Leslie Hour.